Good evening, everybody. Very happy to be here um, and give this uh, give this talk about the University of the Future. At least the vision that I um, I have and we have with the team. Uh, I'll start by explaining uh, my own story because it is intertwined with this biggest problem in the world. Um, probably very few of you know that the world is spending per year two trillion on military, on the wars. Um, but it is projected that by the uh, year 2030, uh, the world will, will need to spend about 18 trillion uh, on education, just on higher education. Because even today, we have 300 million students at any one time in the world. And I'm going to speak about my story, but it's one of billions of stories about people that unfortunately were deprived of good education for many, many decades. Uh, but if we help them to change, if we, help, uh, if we help them to develop to their fullest potential, you'll probably see someone like me standing on the stage uh, in many uh, different parts of the world. So I'm going to uh, speak about how education transformed my own life and now how I am changing the lives of other people exactly because of that. Um, so I was uh, uh, raised in, um, in a town uh, called Mariupol. Until recently, this town was not known to any of you, I think. And uh, I used to receive uh, from my friends uh, birthday cards uh, that would say uh, uh, bad girl, um, bad people or bad girls uh, that behave badly, you know, when they, um, in the next life, they go back to Mariupol. That's how scary that city was. And um, it's, a, it's a town uh, mostly with, um, you know, with factories. It was uh, supplying about 15% of all the steel in the Soviet Union. So when you go out in the morning and you try to breathe, you know, chances are you get a lot of metal inside you. So this is how it was growing. Uh, and the people around me were equally, you know, quite, I would say, mm, relatively uneducated, right? The, the workers of the steel mills. Um, and I was, I was, um, I was different. I, I was lucky because my mother was a teacher. And um, uh, that was the lucky part. The unlucky part was that my mother uh, was a single mother, so we didn't have uh, anybody else, and she had to completely rely on herself to provide for my own education or my life. Um, because of that, I hadn't seen her much, because she had been doing you know, two, three jobs at any one time, the same in the summer. In the summers, I would spend uh, at least uh, three shifts or you know, three months in a Soviet pioneer camps, and as you know, for example, Soviet Union didn't have a lot of seas. And one of the seas that we had, which is called Azov Sea in, in my town, was full of these camps. Right? So I grew up basically among people uh, without seeing much of my parents. Unfortunately, in 1991, when I was 11 years old, the Soviet Union collapsed. And what followed was a crazy period of about six years. So for six years, I had to steal food to eat. I had to find, um, I, I, I wasn't even able to go to school because when I would go to school, um, I was wearing the Soviet uniform that all the, you, you see me in that uniform. I mean, I was, in, in, in this picture, I'm seven years old, but imagine I was already, you know, from 11 to 14, and I felt extremely ashamed to come to school uh, in the uniform while others were already, you know, wearing jeans. So people were making a lot of jokes about me. So eventually I uh, decided to drop out of school because I couldn't handle that anymore, right? And, I, and also I couldn't handle seeing my mother every day um, crying because she was uh, helpless. She was a teacher. She had three educations, higher education, a musician, a philologist, um, and a teacher, a pedagogist, but unfortunately um, was earning less than $20 a month. And um, I, I decided to drop out of school quite early and started doing all kinds of jobs, really. And the easiest jobs were in the market. So I found 
people that were giving me a chance to, to sell goods. So from 6 in the morning until 12 at night, when the last worker from the steel mill would go back, I was selling to them whatever you know I was selling I mean, um, and, and making the commission. And with that commission, I was coming back home. Um, people in the school, uh, the directors of the school where I used to go, they thought that they didn't know my mother. They thought she was probably an alcoholist or something, you know, because who would imagine a kid not going to school? Who would let that happen? Um, so, but for my mother, it was really a big problem that I wasn't um, going to school anymore. So she decided to do something quite radical. So she decided to join the school where I was going before as a teacher. Um, and then the director of the school actually was quite surprised that my mother was not an alcoholist and she was quite a very normal person and there, there must have been happening something weird in the situation with the family. And a bit, a bit, you know, like a year later when, when they knew that she was completely normal, they decided to talk to her and, and tell her that I can come back to school. And so my mother came to me, uh, to my workplace, to a market saying that I have now a chance to go back to school. Um, but I said, I'm not going back to school because I cannot leave if I, you know, either I earn or I learn. Um, and I said, I will go back to school if I find a way to work at night, if I will figure out another job for myself. So during the day, I would study, and during the night, I would work. Luckily for me... Um, there was a radio station, uh, the first commercial radio station in the Soviet Union with a French radio station called Europe Plus. And this radio station decided to open um, an outlet in my town. And they were looking for a DJ at night who could work every 15th minute and every 45th minute to take off the advertisement from the central station and put the advertisement from our town. And I thought it was a great opportunity for me. Luckily, I passed the probation out of what thousand people was chosen. Despite my young age, I promised that I will do all kinds of, you know, I said, I will do whatever you guys want me to do. I'll be the most motivated person in the world, and it will allow me to finish school. So they took me, which I'm very grateful for. So I went to this, uh, I went back to school. I graduated from school, and I felt that there was something wrong with this town. I always felt that this town is not for me. In fact, I made a lot of escapes during when I was little, but they would always catch me in the trains and bring me back to my, to my parents because I was, of course, without a ticket trying to escape. So I was trying to convince a lot of people that I considered my friends to go out of this town with me. And imagine this is 1996. I already felt that there was something extremely wrong with this town, that we had to get out of there because there was a city of no hope, no future. And I went to, uh, to work in the headquarters of this radio station. I thought I was talented and I could get any kind of job. And uh, when I came, I did not expect that I was not welcomed in the headquarters of the radio station um, with my Ukrainian passport. So they couldn't even hire me. They thought I was, um, you know, too young and I was uneducated. But a long story short, after every day standing at the entrance of the radio station and the, the director of the station would come and pass by me, I was every day with a new program, giving him my intellectual work, saying that, please read this program. It's going to be popular among our listeners. Uh, take me. So eventually he gave up and one day he called me. Um, and said that, okay, I can come again. And so I came, I started working, uh, getting cash in envelopes, again, illegally working. Unfortunately, nobody with the Ukrainian passport wanted to rent me a flat, so I ended up living in the railway station for quite a while. Um, and by the time I was 18, I got so tired of surviving, to be honest. And of course, uh, I didn't even dream of educating myself or of going to a university. But luckily, I, one day I hail a taxi. And uh, um, instead of a taxi, a nice car stops. And uh, this was a sort of godsend husband, right? So this was a guy who uh, then decides to marry me, although I was like 18, and, uh, and asks me, what is my dream? 
And my mentor at the radio station always told me, Lana, if there's one thing you can ask for is uh, if you ever get a chance is, is, is to, you know, to learn English. And I told him I want to learn English. But the cost of learning English was equivalent in 1998 to buying a flat in Moscow. So it was a crazy amount of money for me or for anybody. Um, and he was a very kind guy. I, still, I am standing here because of him. Um, he gave me uh, this money. And so I ended up um, later on, thanks to this, uh, applying to universities in Europe. So I, I also want to thank, you know, everyone who's here, everyone who's European who's paying the tax, for <laughs> for people like me, uh, you know, who kind of overcome this barrier, which was almost impossible to overcome and, uh, and apply to the union. So I ended up uh, first in Finland, uh, and it, it will have to do a lot with, with the second part of my talk about the university of the future, um, because exactly, you know, part of that model uh, I studied myself in. And in Finland, uh, after three years, um, they decided that I was 20 best students of the world. I didn't know I was talented. Um, after that, uh, because I was, you know, hailed as, as, as a really good student, I could choose where I want to go next. And a friend of mine said that I should uh, consider German Harvard, which was St. Gallen University. And I thought it was a good idea because all my life, the problem was because I didn't have money. So I thought, where is the money? Is the money is in the banks? Where to learn about the banks? Of course, in Switzerland, right? So I decided to go to Switzerland to learn banking, all right? And then a friend of mine calls me, uh, and she says, I think, Lana, I found the best city on the planet. You have to come and check it out. And that was Barcelona. So I come to Barcelona, fall in love with Barcelona. And uh, she's like, why don't you apply to Pompeo Fabra? There's this new university, uh, which Andreo Mascale at the time decided to open. And that was like the first year of that university. So I was lucky enough as well, again, lucky to get this uh, scholarship. And not, uh, not only was it a scholarship, but it was also... A leaving allowance, right? Because I didn't have money to leave. Either I had to, you know, learn or earn, right? So it was very crucial for me. So I stayed here, uh, finished the university, um, and then, of course, decided to go to work for a bank, for, for banks. I ended up working for many, many international banks, Citibank, uh, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs, and became number one in the world as a salesperson. Because by that time, obviously, I could... <laughs> I could sell you, they would say, snow in winter in New York, you know. So, and they were literally, you know, taking me to different parts of the world, to London, to New York, to show me, like, how is, you know, this salesperson looking like, and what is she doing. So, I earned a lot of money suddenly. So, imagine me going from living on a railway to suddenly getting paychecks, you know, millions of dollars, and I... I started living a very weird life from the, you know, in the beginning, maybe, you know, the football players when, when they're young and they're, and they get so much money, they, in the beginning, like they, they kind of get lost, right? So I got lost for a while. So I was like, you know, learning to play polo, you know, because it was like expensive and I could like at least feel that I'm spending something, you know, of course I helped all my friends and, you know, took them on holidays and, you know, gave them very expensive things. Um, I mean, it was kind of going uh, really fun for, for a while. And then I decided to, like, something was going on, like something wrong was going on. So I took a trip to Tibet. Um, it wasn't even my dream. So, you know, a little kind of stop uh, about this, like how the hell I ended up in Tibet. And I intentionally uh, wanted to show you this picture because the most important thing in Tibet is the sky. The sky is insane. You really see the Milky Way, and it makes you feel very, very small. Right? So when I was there, I realized that all of my titles and all of my money and all of whatever I think of myself is actually nothing. Right? So with that very clear realization, I'm coming back from Tibet in May, and in May... The first Ukrainian war happens. 
I'm, I'm just coming back and I'm getting a video how my house, the house which, you know, my mother had been waiting for so long, for like she spent 20 years on this house, is completely bombed. And I'm like watching it. And that was really something that shook me tremendously. I realized that now it's a, it's a moment to stop, to really rethink everything that I thought before, because I couldn't imagine this ever happening. I knew Mariupol was bad, but not that bad. And now you know it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I decided to take all of the money I had and start helping the people that were now running from the war. On a single day in May 9th, 300 people died in, in just my street. In, in, in not my street, but in my barrio. So giving back was necessary, was essential, and this is how it started for me. So I started relocating people from Mariupol, from Kramatorsk, from Donetsk to work, and finding them the jobs. And then I realized that these people don't have education. I can move them to Moscow. I can move them to Kiev. But they, they don't know how to survive because they don't have education. And then I realized that I better, instead of just giving them money, send them somewhere to learn, send them somewhere to study. And this is how university of the, I mean, the university that now I'm going to present to you started. Um, and then I thought, how many people, because I'm a good salesperson, I thought maybe I can go and talk to Bill Gates and convince him to kind of add more money to, to the pot that I was going to give out in addition to my money, because I thought, you know, you know, probably it's a clever idea. So let's think together um, with me how I was thinking back then. I was thinking, this guy has more than $100 billion. He definitely can give $1 billion to educate people. I thought, $1 billion for sure he can give. Okay. So let's start with this assumption. And I'm a good salesperson, so I ought to convince the guy to give me this billion. So imagine I have it. Then what? Okay. Then I thought, I need to... Um, be sure that I'm sending them to the best universities. I'm going to find the best students. I'm going to find the most talented people that I could find uh, with the need, with the financial need, and I'm going to send them to the best schools. How many people like that can I send with a billion dollars? And then I thought, okay, what would be my choice number one of a university? And I thought, Stanford. And then I was like, okay, what's the price of Stanford? The first thing I thought about, it's like 100000 a year, the total cost of attendance is tuition plus the living expense. And if you're a bachelor, if you're a young person, right, it's four years of tuition and attendance that you have to cover. So in total, a billion dollars can get you two and a half thousand people. If you thought it was more, think about it again. Two and a half thousand people only. Now, remember this number versus how many students are in the world? 300 million. So I realized asking a donor is not going to be a scalable solution for the world. There had to be something else besides the fact that it's very difficult to enter into Stanford. Harvard and Princeton accept less than 2% of people that are poor. It's just a fact. It's impossible. There's 50 people per place. Each one of them is ready to pay any money just to get in there. So, you know, the money argument won't work for them. So there had to be something else. I realized there had to be a different solution. And as I was working as a financial engineer, I thought, I can figure out this problem. But I wanted to know how big is the problem. And remember that the problem is $20 trillion a year. It's a huge problem. So how can we come up? with a solution to the 20 trillion a year problem to educate the world. And still the world is young and stupid, we say. Then I looked at Europe. Maybe Europe is cheaper. And I wanted to share with you today the example of United Kingdom, because United Kingdom is considered the top of the Olymp in Europe, in European education. Many parents dream about sending their kids to UK. So. What do we know about UK? 95% about new students in UK colleges have to take a loan from the government to enter. What does it mean? That means that if there were no loans, they couldn't attend. Just simply, 
they also don't have the money. So it's not just the Ukrainians that don't have the money, I realized. It's also the people in UK. And then of those who take the loan, which remember is 95%, 80% are in default. So these loans never get repaid. And that also told me that if the loan delinquencies are so big, so 80% of people do not even come to earn 25000 a year after graduating from a UK university. That just tells us that the quality uh, is bankrupt. So I was thinking, okay, UK is not probably a solution. It's expensive and yet not so good. Now, then I also learned, which was really shocking, that Oxford, for example, if you take computer science education or mathematics as a subject, how many new students a year Oxford takes from the entire world? Less than 30. Just keep this number in your mind. So, we decided... Um, or I decided first myself, and then I decided to assemble the team of geniuses for seven days in Barcelona in a garage of a boat in Port Olympic to come up with a solution to this problem of financial barriers and bad quality. And who, if not McKinsey, can help us with this question? So I was lucky to have met the number two in McKinsey globally, who is currently the chairman of our university, because of course he couldn't say no, right? We don't take prisoners. So it's Ingo Baer from Morgenstein, who you see on the picture. I asked him this question. I said, Ingo, how can we solve this problem? Let's think about it together. And then I also brought in a designer, right? Because if you want to design a new system, you need a designer for anything. So designers are not just the people that make things pretty. They also uh, make things... They plan things, right? So we invited the world's best two designers, you also see them on the picture, Anton and Irene, to come uh, with us for seven days to come up with a solution. Um, and I want to walk you through our thought process. So we needed to decide, what are we going to teach as a university? Are we going to teach you know, social, social sciences? Or are we going to teach arts? Or, you know, what should this university teach? And uh, we decided to look at the value pyramid. Like, where is the highest value today in business and society uh, or in our daily lives? And it turns out it's software and algorithmic content. Algorithmic content is, when you look at Uber, for example, right? The Uber uses different content from, you know, your location, um, you know, the rating of a driver, etc., etc., combines this different content and gives you a solution. So it's, it's even higher in value than software. And because the, we live in the world of Internet, you know, high-speed um, high broadband Internet, we understood that all of the businesses of the future will be digital or they won't exist. Um, therefore, we decided that our university... Instead of being, you know, usually you have school of engineering separately, school of design separately, school of business also separately. In Harbor Space, we decided to have it all fused. So we're going to have a school, primarily a school of engineering, but then it's going to be a school of design because you as users don't understand that, for example, Google is the most complex set of mathematical equations. You don't feel it on a daily basis, right? Because you have a user interface. So we're going to teach how to design and build user interfaces. And that's why design and business, we thought we're going to teach everything from a prism of an early stage digital venture. We're not going to teach our, our students uh, things that are, um, you know, how to manage a big enterprise. We're going, to manage, we're going to teach them how to manage a very small enterprise. So every student at Harbor Space, the first module, the first three weeks has to build a business. Every single one of them, no matter if they come from engineering or they come from design or business discipline, they have to learn the ropes of building a business from scratch within three weeks. They all have to finish with that. This is called Zero to Hero, the first three weeks at Harvard Space. And then, um, how do we solve for access? How do we solve for financing? How can we finance 
hundreds of thousands of students. We're going to turn to employers. What is other biggest market that can match 300 million students? Only employers market. So we decided we're going to team up with employers to co-finance education of our students. And the students are going to work three... Uh, the students are going to study three hours a day, and they're going to work four hours a day, every day. And by working, they're going to be paying in value, in kind, for the tuition uh, that uh, is covered by the company and the university. And of course, the tuition has to be as low as possible. We have to be cost leaders for a given level of quality. Never allow yourself to talk about the price if you don't speak about the quality. I just, you know, a small remark. So our goal in terms of quality was Stanford or better. Now, in order to do that, we needed someone from Stanford. So we got someone from Stanford to do it. By the way, Zero to Hero is taught by Cameron Alakian, who comes from Stanford. He's uh, also a co-founder. Uh, and it's inclusive, thanks to the scheme of... Uh, uh, employer uh, funding, because we really go out and find these people. We find what we call uh, world treasures. They are right now, and you know, every little town, every little school has a genius. We just need to go out and find them. And luckily today, the winners of the national, international competitions, they're all known to us. We can access them through internet. So we work as a football club more than as a university, we find them, uh, we talk to them, we understand their problems and, you know, how to, how to bring them to Barcelona uh, in the shortest period of time, how to finance their stay here. And it costs about 1,700 uh, euros a month to have a student in Barcelona uh, with uh, tuition and uh, living allowance uh, together. And, of course, we have to provide the letters to the embassies that we're going to support them and everything else. So it has to be inclusive. I mean, I just want to go back to this to say that it's, you know, I couldn't imagine building a uni for only people that can pay. I thought this would be, again, a crazy thing, just like we've already built this world on this premise, right? 99% of the people do not have access to quality education. It's absolute truth. So, and then we decided how are we going to teach this and then um, the Finnish system turns out to be the best system. Why? Because they divide a year into 15 modules of three weeks. Each week, sorry, each three-week module, students take one subject at a time. Only one subject at a time. This allows us to bring the best people in the world for three weeks. Because the best people in the world will not want to be teachers for the rest of their life. But for three weeks, they're ready to donate their time. They're very interested. If you can guarantee that there will be very interesting students, and of course we tell them that the students they're going to teach wouldn't ever have a chance in this life if we were not pulling uh, the resources together and they have to come and you know give this inspiration and love to the students. Um, so uh, we have 15 uh, modules. Every module, as I said, is three weeks, 45 hours, four European transfer, uh, credit transfer system credits. I mean, I know that there are some people from the, in the audience uh, from the university space, so you know what it means. It means 100 hours. Um, and basically the course is packed. The normal course that takes six months is packed into 15 days. But because you're focused on one thing, you actually accomplish it really well. And we have students here in the audience. If you want to talk to them later, they can tell you that it works really well, much better than the semester system or the system like in the UK, where they have a two-week period once a year. They have to give all the eight exams. Can you imagine? Like they're really stressed. They just study it by heart. They spit it out and forget. Uh, in Harvard Space, it's different. Then... Every module, students have a choice. They have two days to come and check different courses. And only after they check the courses, they decide if they want to stay in that course. What it allows us is never to have a student in the class that is not interested in that class. 
So teachers are really, really happy. They're really enjoying teacher, uh, sorry, students who want to be there and vice versa, right? Students do not, uh, do not feel forced to be in the class. And plus, it's highly, highly personalized because our students are very, I would say, well prepared already uh, from before. So we have to adapt. Like if a student comes that knows math uh, already better than a professor, why would we force the students to take it, right? Uh, education has to be relevant. Again, coming back to the uh, quality question. So uh, here we have, it, uh, you know, and the vision for the University of the Future definitely has to be that professors know what they're talking about. If they're teaching entrepreneurship, they have to be entrepreneurs because entrepreneurship cannot be learned by the book. Uh, therefore, we only invite people, whether they're professors or they're um, other, uh, um, other just practitioners that have practical, proven, world-level, world-class experience in the subject. And we never settle for less. And every year it changes, right? This year it could be that a Japanese guy is number one in the world in this field. The next year it's someone else. So the current system of education where professor is, once a professor, forever professor, it doesn't work because the professors stop developing. They just... They just, you know, decay because there's no motivation, no structural motivation for them to, to, to change, for them to improve. And by the way, if you're a professor, the moment you become a professor, you stop working and you lose your expertise immediately. You know, in artificial intelligence, things are changing every week entirely almost. Evergreen. So that brings me to um, the last point. The university has to change its curriculum, its professors. Everything has to change as the world changes. And as you know, the world changes now, not in a linear fashion, but in an exponential fashion because of the technologies, right? And the converges of technologies. Therefore, being evergreen is essential. So you have to be, the university of the future has to be by design evergreen. For example, we can make a mistake with a professor, but only once, because the students will vote the professor out, and the next time, the professor never gets invited. So we make a mistake, but only once. And lastly, I believe that the University of the Future will be global. So we will come to India. We will come to... Now we're in Thailand. We have a huge project in Thailand, 20,000 students, an existing university that asked us to disrupt itself. It's the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, we are fully accredited. If this is something on your mind, in, in Thailand, we are in the process of being accredited in, uh, in Europe. But yeah, I see 50 campuses around the world so that, you know, we have this super diversity and uh, people can travel between campuses at any one time. Now they can travel between Bangkok and Barcelona, but hopefully in the future to many more locations. So to the University of the Future, hopefully, I mean, this is an open question, right? I mean, this is just one uh, way of solving the problem. And I hope, I hope many of you here in the audience uh, will contribute to uh, figuring out the solution to the $20 trillion a year problem. So thank you very much.